What's up guys? I have heard a lot on YouTube about the cathedrals and everything, and I thought I would throw my two cents in on this subject. But first off, for those of you who don't know me, oh, you're a contractor. I've never heard that one before. It kind of made me laugh, so yeah. You know what being a contractor means? It means that you're out fixing things and doing work when it's freezing cold out. It also means that you never make excuses and you don't BS people because good luck getting people to trust you with tens and thousands of dollars to work on the most expensive thing that they own if you BS everybody. And hey, how many of you wouldn't want me to come and take your old kitchen that looked like this and make it look like this? I can't wait till I can do it to mine. But I can't blame anybody for questioning that claim. I've heard a lot of claims in the comments that I can see right through. <laughs> the difference being a true craftsman will never miss an opportunity to show off their work. Now, what does modern building have to do with Gothic cathedrals? Well, if you don't see the forest that went into building this cathedral, then stick around because before any of those arches were built, the carpenters built everything out of wood first. And you may think I'm completely full of it, but honestly, I would not have any problem whatsoever managing this project, even though I've never cut a stone block in my life. Just like I've worked for other contractors that don't know how to run a saw or a nail gun, what's important is understanding what has to be done and what order to do it in. So I'm going to give you guys a basic course on the fundamentals of construction, and then let's see what you think about this building after that. Now, nobody's arguing that this wasn't built by an advanced culture, but my idea of advanced engineering and your idea may differ because a lot of people think that this could only be built with advanced machinery. And I know that construction is a lot of skill and a lot of hard work and that today's power tools only make the construction process faster, but it's not necessary. And just real quick, I want to go through the different types of construction. Here we're looking at St. Patrick's in New York. And to just look at the finished product, you'd think that this was built the same as Cologne Cathedral that I was showing just a moment ago. But the fact of the matter is, this is all wood framed and stuccoed. Looks just like stone in the finished product. This is the exact same type of construction as was used for the World's Fairs and these magnificent Tatarian structures that burned down and killed a bunch of people. And compared to the ancient Roman or the Gothic style of architecture, this is 50 times faster, 50 times cheaper. And 99% of this is all done by hand. You don't need cranes. You don't need forklifts. You don't need anything. These are just put together piece by piece. And, you know, boards are not that hard to handle. And once the wood framing structure is done, then you just stucco over the top of it and it looks like stone. Now let's break this down into the independent parts. An important fundamental structure to understand is the Roman arch. In masonry, this is required for any opening that you're gonna have in a wall, a door, a window, whatever. Modern day, we use structural steel. This is called a window lintel, but you have to put that in there to support the weight of the bricks up above. Before structural steel, there was the Roman arch that takes all of the weight of the masonry up above and directs it down to each side of the opening. While looking at a bunch of random photographs, I really don't have a good way of telling if this was built there on purpose or if not, because basement windows are a very good thing. Not only can you get airflow into an area that's prone to be damp, but also any of the larger buildings being built between 1700 AD and 1950 would have had boiler rooms down in the bottom that powered the radiator heaters that were in all of the rooms. My grade school still had these in there. And hey, people are smart. I mean, as long as they have good nutrition like we did do today, then they were just as smart as we are, if not smarter. So now you know when looking at random photos of old buildings that that arch has to be there for any opening doesn't matter where it's at on the elevation of the building while we're at the ground level let's talk about foundations the bigger the building the deeper the foundation has to go every one of those tiny looking yellow lifts that they're using 
is the size of a bulldozer and it probably extends up about 50 feet. And I just want to say that the street levels of some cities have changed, some by catastrophe and flooding, some by man-made structures. But it's really hard to tell which it is by random photos. Let's look at La Sagrada Familia. Construction of this began back in the 1880s, so we do have photos of all the different phases. And it was just completed a year or two ago, I believe. Even with modern machinery, it is a rather audacious endeavor to build a cathedral. But look down at the bottom right there, and what do you see? These are the purpose-built crypts underneath of the cathedral, and you can judge by that tree, say the tree's probably 30 feet tall, so this is at least 60 feet down into the ground. They built these crypts underneath because back around 13th, 14th century, the way the Catholic Church financed their cathedrals was to sell indulgences to people, which not only bought you forgiveness from your sins, but also that of your ancestors. They'd tell you that your father's going to burn in hell if you don't pay an indulgence. So, you know, what are you going to do? Then in the older cathedrals, they would sell burial plots underneath the finished cathedral, just dig a new grave. And this progressed into them just making vaults underneath the cathedrals. Now, if you're into buried cities, look at Rome. It goes down 200 feet underneath the city streets of today. But um, some of this stuff was built intentionally. I hope nobody's getting bored. I will have a chronology down in the comments or description box that you can check and skip around if you want. But if you watch this whole video, you will understand every piece that you're looking at and why it's there. But I want to explain the logistics of how this works real quick and dispel, dispel a couple of myths. First off, the horse and buggy myth. First off, draft horses are extremely strong. They can A, a team of two can drag like 20,000 pounds on skids. So they're not going to have any problem pulling five or 10,000 pounds that's on wheels as opposed to skids. But that's not the primary source of transportation, maybe to take it the last half mile. All of these are built within a stone's throw of major riverways. So they ship everything in to the site. Here you can see Cologne Cathedral by the Rhine. Here's Notre Dame again by the Rhine. And then Ulm Cathedral right off of the Danube. The riverways were the ancient highways, and these were the big cities. Look at Salt Lake City Cathedral for an example, and you can see that they just drop off rough cut stone blocks from the quarry. You've got either your lowest play, paid or your slaves working in the quarry. And then once it gets dropped off, you have different grades of craftsmen there on site. The other myth is you expect me to believe that they did all that with hammer and chisel. I would say that what, 70, 80% of all of the stone quarry today is done by hand. They do have big machines like this, but due to the nature of stone, splitting it is fast and efficient with hammer and chisels. Okay, finally, let's talk about how these things are built. <laughs> all the cathedrals started out as basic basilicas like this, and it was progression in technology that made the bigger better possible. They came up with the pointed arch, the ribbed vault, the trussed roof, and then the flying buttresses. There's a time anomaly associated with these pointed arches as well. The first ones are attributed to the Nilometer in Egypt in 800 AD, and then they didn't make a big comeback until the 12th century re Renaissance. And I've talked about how there's a gap in the technology from the fall of the Romans to the 12th and 13th century and they make up with this by the 12th century Renaissance. And I'd say technology-wise, in 1200 AD, you know, just before the catastrophes, it was probably about like the 17th century, and the world was set back 500 years. Uh, Alfred Gainus is associated with these pointed arches, and he was a Islamic thinker of the 800 AD era, and his works all disappeared and then resurfaced in... 15th century Renaissance Italy, just like the all of the ancient, quote-unquote, ancient Roman writers resurfaced during this time. But the pointed arch is much stronger than the Roman arch and can hold more weight. So when you have an arch, it's pushing out laterally from the center. 
and they wanted to keep building higher and higher with these. So you had to install buttresses to counter that force that's pushing outwards. The buttresses add what's known as shear value or shear strength. And I describe this to customers as if you have a cardboard box and the bottom of it is taped and you turn it up on its side and you push down on it, it's going to be stiff and rigid. If you cut that tape loose, then it, the box will collapse because you've taken away all of the shear value. Now, it would have been simple to add just triangle buttresses like this, but all of those big stained glass windows, they want as much light getting in as possible, so they refined this. They came up with flying buttresses held up by spires so that you can transfer the load out and down. You still have all of the same pieces that you started with, only now you're letting all kinds of light in through the beautiful stained glass windows. And here we can see, I think this is Salzburg Cathedral, that was an old basilica that was run down for hundreds of years, the townspeople were making fun of it. The Protestants didn't like the big gaudy churches that had been built there previously, so they sat empty. Finally, there were calls to restore it, and you can see here the first thing they did was stabilize where the rib vaults that I'm going to show you in a minute connect on the exterior. Now you understand the principles of the pointed spire and the flying buttresses to support these ribbed vaults that are on the inside. Take that pointed arch and you turn it 45 degrees going both ways and you have a ribbed vault. Once that basic concept was proven to work, it's no different than today. I mean, architects were striving to outdo each other and they did. They, they got very creative with this. But let's break this down. You have the two main pointed arches forming the X and then you have legs coming down to another pointed arch coming up. And then in the center, I don't even think that was necessary. That's probably just decorative planted onto the bottom. But I don't mean to downplay this. This is an insane level of craftsmanship, and I'm sure fortunes were made over this. Or maybe they did do it for the glory of God. I don't know. We'll get into the builders in a different video. I probably should have explained this earlier, but now's a good time. For all of the flying buttresses and all of the pointed arches, Every bit of it has to be made out of wood first, so entire forests were cut down, and all of this was made out of wood first, and then stone shaped to the forms. Here you see they're shoring up the flying buttresses and transferring the wood back to the weight partially while they're doing the construction. And a couple years ago, I kept hearing, how do these stone buildings burn down? And then Notre Dame happened. On top of the rib vaults up here, they would just pack it with loose stone, possibly concrete, but it's not, it's porous, it's not waterproof. So they came up with the roof truss. By making this all one self-contained unit, you're taking the weight and transferring it directly down on the outside walls. If you were using just regular roof rafters, then you would have the same problem you had with your arches. You'd have the outward force and you would need flying buttresses up at the top. The earlier cathedrals, before they came up with the roof truss, and they've got the extra row of buttresses up very high right there. For the renovation at the Notre Dame Cathedral, they are using all of the methods that they used back in the 13th century when they started this stuff. They're doing it completely by hand, start to finish, and I counted about 20 carpenters there, and they made one of these trusses in a week. And I think they said they need 52 of them. So one year to complete all of the trusses. That's really not bad. And here they're doing a test run of their pulley system on the ground before they go up and attempt the real thing way up in the air. Now, as far as the stone cutting, you would have had different grades of masons out on the job. And like I said, they, they probably made, they did make fortunes off of this and started their own little sect over there. But the best of the best was doing this kind of work and, you know, the intricate spires out front and all of that. Then you got your B team guys doing the gargoyles that are hundreds of feet up in the air so it doesn't have to be that fine of detail. I call these guys backside framers. They're good enough that you can turn them loose on the backside of the house, but you don't want them working on the entryway where everybody's attention is going to be focused. Also pretty high up on the pay scale would be the guys that actually shaped the stone for all of the pointed arches and the columns. Now, I'm assuming that they, they actually did all this with hammer and chisel, but I do want to show you guys a couple of old guys, three old guys with hand saws out in a limestone quarry, 
can cut this big, huge block in an afternoon. So you get a whole bunch of healthy young men out there and you can get a lot of work done. The cathedrals are made of relatively soft stone, sandstone and limestone and so forth. But there's some nice clean cut blocks ready to stack. Now let's talk about getting these stones into place. Nobody was lifting any of this. They were very intelligent people and knew all of the tricks of the trade. But Cologne Cathedral, again, more evidence of the 13th century reset. They knew what they planned on building when they started this. And then a bunch of people died during the 14th century catastrophes. And it set empty for 400 years with the old medieval crane still on top. You have the same story with the Santa Maria del Four in Italy. They started construction, you know, before the catastrophes and it shut down for 80 years before Filippo Brunelleschi could figure out how to put a dome on top of it. But this crane was absolutely massive. And honestly, I think that maybe they were using this to bring up, you know, pallets of bricks or blocks at a time because that just kind of looks like overkill to me. Because when you look at the building of the U.S. state capitals here, you can see that they're using much smaller tripods and cap stands. And this is advanced mechanics, advanced engineering. These people weren't stupid and it doesn't take internal combustion machines to get this stuff done. They knew what they were doing. You can generate a ton of force with a 12 foot long board lever. And this is much more advanced than that with uh, pulleys, block and tackles and able to lift multi-ton blocks with ease. Uh, they, they took the same wisdom and intelligence into the design of their carts to move all of this stuff. And they knew that what they were doing. So let's combine all this to make a cathedral. You know the basic structural component parts. So just as an allegory, let's look at a house with plain board and batten siding on the front. That's just two by four frame walls with siding on it. Now, for a fancy Victorian house, you still have the same structural two by four wall and you add on a lot of fancy fluted columns and corbels and arches and all of this stuff. Well, they did the same thing with a cathedral. They took the basic structure of a basilica. They added in the spires and the flying buttresses. And then they went absolutely insane with ornamentation on top of all of those structural members. I mean, money is no object here. It's hundreds of years of good work, job security. Let's do it up. We're, we're going to carve all this crazy stuff down here on the ground, and then we're going to build scaffolds, and then we're going to go up there and plant this stuff all over the place. It's done just like any modern production, only the factory is right out front, and you make the pieces on site, assemble it, and then crane everything up into place about the only thing I haven't covered is I know somebody will say well yeah they couldn't have dug that out and I, I'm sorry but people really don't know what hard work is these days what up until 80 years ago they still had chain gangs in America and what about you know all those conquered people in war that people would own outright well they bust rock and they dig ditches and dig holes for you and let me tell you, this is nowhere near the worst job out there. I would take running a shovel any day of the week over running one of these saws. This is a constant full body lunge back and forth in rhythm with a partner. And if you guys can keep this going for two minutes straight, you're like Olympic level athlete. I would much rather be on a shovel than running one of these all day. So there you have it, guys. It's really not that hard. Once you understand the basic principles of what's going on here. And yeah, I could totally run this project. If I was in France, I'd, I'd be totally stoked to be on this team. Hope you learned something. I'll see you on the next one. Peace out.